Good afternoon. I'm Juliane Kempfield. I'm the director of Deutsches Haus at NYU. Welcome to Permanent Crisis, Humanities in a Disenchanted Age, a conversation between Paul Ryder, Chet Wellman, and Sharon Malkus, who mm. will moderate. We're delighted to um, present this event, which is, of course, based on the most recent uh, publication by both um, Paul and Chet. Uh, the book of the same name that just came out with the University of Chicago Press. Before I introduce uh, our distinguished speakers, just a few remarks about the, the uplauf, about the schedule. Uh, Paul and Chet will uh, briefly introduce their uh, book and then uh, they will have the conversation with Sharon followed by the uh, Q&A with you. You may submit your questions via the Q&A button, which you'll see at the bottom of uh, your screen, and you may submit your questions in writing. Uh, and then our speakers will uh, read the questions and answer them. Um, anything else about the uplauf? I can't remember, but now let me, of course, thank Chad and Paul for this fabulous and eternally timely uh, book and um, Sharon for agreeing to moderate their conversation. Thanks to the U University of Chicago Press for, for publishing this book and especially to Carrie Olivia Adams at the University of Chicago Press for her support and uh, uh, help with the arrangement of this event. Thank you to the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service for supporting uh, Deutsches Haus at NYU's academically inclined events. Uh, thank you, my colleagues, Sarah and Christian and Sasha for tirelessly working behind the scenes. And thank you, the audience for attending this conversation. I will now introduce our three speakers and my colleague Zara will post their bio info uh, for you to see in the uh, chat, I believe. So you can also read it later. And we will also post the link for Permanent Crisis, the book um, in the chat. So let me start with Paul. Paul Ryder teaches in the German department at Ohio State University. Hi, Paul. Welcome back. <laughs> now. Welcome to the virtual Deutsches Haus. We've had events with you, of course, before on the premises, and that will hopefully happen again, too. He is the author of several books, including Bambi's Jewish Roots, and has edited and translated many others. His writing has appeared in Harper's Magazine, the New York Review of Books, Book Forum, the Chronicle of Higher Education, and the Paris Review. He's currently working on a new English translation of Marx's Kapital, Volume 1, which he is co-editing with Paul North. Chet Wellman, whom you will see shortly, teaches in the German department, hi Chet, at the University of Virginia. He has published widely on the history of higher education and recently co-edited the anthology, The Rise of the Research University. He's also the author of several books, including Organizing Enlightenment, Information Overload, and The Invention of the Modern Research University. Sharon Marcus, our moderator, teaches at Columbia University. Hi, Sharon. Welcome to the virtual Deutsches Haus, where she is the Orlando Harriman Professor of English and Comparative Literature, specializing in 19th century British and French culture. Her scholarship analyzes the cultural assignment of value in domains as diverse as architecture, social relationships, literary criticism, and performance culture. Sharon is the author of Apartment Stories, City and Home in 19th Century Paris and London, Between Women, Marriage, Desire, and Friendship in Victorian England, and The Drama of Celebrity. Welcome to Permanent Crisis. Thank you, uh, Ileana, so much for the introduction. And um, thank you also to Sarah and Sasha and Christian for the organizational work. Thank you to Sharon for 
um, agreeing to moderate. It's very nice of you. It's great to meet you. Um, and thanks uh, to the audience for, for being here. Chad and I are, are very grateful for your interest in our work. We, um, we're gonna begin with a very short introduction to the book and, um, and then we'll start responding to Sharon's questions. So I'll start the introduction and then uh, pass it to, to Chad who will fill in what I've, what I've left out. <clears throat> um, we, uh, we began this, this project really as it often happens with another project. That project was a, uh, an addition of Nietzsche's lectures on the German education system. And in fact, we presented that project at Deutsches House in person, which we were um, very grateful for the opportunity to do. Um, and there Nietzsche offers a number of criticisms of the German higher education system at a time when the German, actually, I have to correct myself, the German education system, he talks about uh, elementary schools, uh, gymnasium, high schools, and, and universities as well, kind of focused on universities. And he offers a number of criticisms of the university system there uh, at a time when the German university system was widely considered to be the, uh, the best in the world that resonate with very contemporary accounts of uh, what's going on in higher education, the pressure to vocationalize, uh, the deformities caused by specialization, um, whether building is, is scalable and, and so on. And uh, Chad and I uh, thought that um, we should, uh, <clears throat> that it might be productive to investigate how far this goes back. I, I should also mention that in doing the, the, the research um, for the edition, we also realized that Nietzsche was hardly alone in this. Nietzsche, of course, always likes to present himself as a total uh, Einzelgänger, somebody who's going against the herd. But in fact, a lot of what he says in this book is, is derivative. And interestingly, um, there are people from across the political spec spectrum sounding similar uh, concerns. So we were interested in seeing how, how far back this, uh, some of these lines of, of criticism went, this, this discourse of the crisis of the humanities, really liberal education is what Nietzsche was um, talking about. Um, but today it's more, uh, this, this kind of discourse is more centered on the, <clears throat> the humanities um, as the sciences have a, you know, a STEM application. Um, in any case, we went uh, back to the beginning of the German research university system and we saw that for a number of the founders of this system, um, and this is a time when in our account, the modern, humanities really took shape. Um, the founders were excited by certain uh, possibilities um, brought about through the processes of democratization, modernization, uh, or by big processes of modernization, democratization, secularization, um, and also bureaucratic rationalization, but they also feared these things as, as well. And they were seen as um, uh, bringers of possibility, but also potential agents of, of, of crisis too. And we identified this uh, as a persistent theme in crisis discourse, but we're also interested in tracking the evolution. The story is, is not just one of the eternal return of the same. And we were uh, interested particularly in how the, um, the ascent of the natural sciences in, in, in Germany in the 19th century affected this discussion of crisis in the humanities. And one of the central claims or another central claim in the book is that uh, at a certain point the humanities claim for themselves the role of being able to remedy a crisis in society a crisis of meaning and other things brought about in part by the uh, the rise of the natural sciences in a more technocratic society um, and that uh, this is um, <clears throat> then a situation where uh, crisis becomes a central part of the justification for the humanities. And we think that it has re remained as, as, as such. Um, this is not necessarily a critique. Um, one of the things that Chad and I try to point out in the book is that this discourse of, of crisis has had many productive moments, um, including uh, a seminal moment when Wilhelm Bildtai basically um, coined the notion of the humanities in Germany, the Geisteswissenschaften, um, indirect conversation with what people in the natural sciences were saying about what they could do. And in fact, uh, Diltai uses as an epigraph for his uh, classic introduction to the humanities, 
he uses an epigraph, a, a line from a text by the famous um, physicist uh, uh, Hermann Helmholtz, and uh, that is no coincidence, uh, since Helmholtz was not simply a scientist, but also a theoretician of the university, a, a rector, um, and somebody who had a lot to say about the relationship between the uh, the humanities and the the uh, the sciences, the natural sciences, and it's here also that Diltai develops the notion, so certain notions of what the humanities can do that the natural sciences don't do. Most notably, the idea of verstehen or understanding as as over against explanation. Um, so um, a big part of what we do is uh, tell the story of how we get from the um, works of the founders of the research university through Nietzsche to Helmholtz and then to Max Weber, um, who also plays a, a, a crucial role in the book. And I'll let Chad pick it up here. Uh, thanks, Paul. I will I'll, I stop the narration of the book um, because I think we can get into that. And I imagine Sharon has uh, interesting questions, but um, and I would, with one, one kind of observation uh, as to not only the what, but the why of the book. And I think this resonates with Paul as well. And I imagine many, many folks, uh, however you're related somehow with academia or the university, is that simultaneously as we were writing this book, I, uh, long story, uh, found myself trying to lead a reform of the undergraduate educational program here at UVA. And that was a seven year process, finally happened, it now exists and I didn't think it would, these things usually fail. And so for me, this book and what this book is about is a, it's a, has a presentist, concern with it, overwhelmingly so, trying to make sense of the distinctions and the boundaries and the institutional norms and just the opaque categories that I fall, when I invoke the humanities where, or when I invoke um, the natural sciences, they didn't work in the political context of curricular form at the University of Virginia. And so part of this project, but also I think part of the conceptual argument of the book is that the humanities have all, the modern humanities as we use it, have always been uh, defined by a, a presentism that pits them over and against as a solution, as uh, a rectifying force, as a check on some perceived anxiety, some perceived threat. And at least for me, I was not excluded <laughs> from that. I didn't escape uh, that as well. So I'll just leave it right there and um, we can return to, to the larger um, arc of the book because I'm actually really interested in Apollo's as well to hear uh, Sharon's, I imagine, not easy softball questions, but probably really fascinating. Well, I'm going to start with questions that pick up on the large arc of the book and, and ask you to give us, since this is you in person, the book is extremely measured and gives each thinker you discuss its due and you tend to be very sparing about your opinions, although you also clearly have opinions. The book is really relevant for anyone trying to think about what the humanities can and can't do today. So one question I have, and I think it's a good place to start, is, as you've said, you present the history of the humanities as always being presented as a cure for what ails modernity, a fix for various crises, and therefore in permanent relationship to crisis. What I'd like you to do is of the many ills you chart in the book that the humanities were supposed to solve, pick two, the one that you found the least persuasive or the most surprising and preposterous, like really the humanities were supposed to fix this problem. And one that you actually, even if you think it lines up with what you call overpromising, you have a soft spot for like, you know, maybe the humanities really could help with this crisis that modernity poses. Paul, you want to go ahead? Um, sure. Well, I'll I'll pick one that is uh, uh, that is I would say uh, that can stand as both things. Um, in other words, um, that can um, be something that uh, the humanities um, overpromises about, um, but is simultaneously something that I think. That humanities are um, in, in, invaluable in helping with. Um, one of the uh, the questions that Chad, both Chad and I are, are, are interested in 
um, is uh, the scalability of, of building. And uh, maybe we feel that as, as Germanists, we have some responsibility to do like a serious genealogy of the term when it's thrown around loosely, as it often is. Um, but also, I think it has to do with um, having looked carefully at early discussions of Bildung and tried to track continuities um, in, its, uh, in its development, and then having watched certain things just kind of fall out um, of the discussion fairly quickly. So, um, Bildung um, for a long time um, involved uh, both the promise of freedom, um, as you you, uh, are, you develop to a certain point where you achieve intellectual independence, which is a freeing, emancipatory thing, and it was definitely in its modern inst instantiation conceived in that kind of uh, democratic spirit, but also you know with this twist um, that preceding the freedom went. Uh, a, a necessary respect for uh, tradition and, and also a, a disciplinary process. And um, <clears throat> you see a recognition of that, um, not only in uh, German thinkers, uh, Nietzsche, for example, one of the things he is upset about is this new pedagogical idea, as he puts it, of just fostering the free personality. And he says that, you know, it doesn't really work like that. Too much freedom too early is a, is a bad thing. Um, you see this also in Arendt, in, in Lionel Trilling, um, and today, the moment when uh, humanists, um, obviously, our argument is that this idea of crisis is nothing new, but at the same time, you know, there can be different uh, degrees of, of uh, desperation, and at a time when um, people seem very eager to make the case that the humani humanities are absolutely consonant with democratic um, ideals and um, the, the, the process of democratization, I think there's a resistance to discuss that, uh, that side, that other side of, of, of Bildung, the restraint side, mm -hmm. the disciplinary side of Bildung. And there's just the ideal of, hey, come in and, you know, to the humanist uh, classroom and you will get Bildung and it can happen, you know, anywhere. Um, this is, uh, uh, in, in fact, you've, uh, you, you see the term in recent discussions of what the humanities can provide for society. Uh, you see the term mass building, which for some people would be almost an oxymoron. Um, but at the same time, um, like Chad, I've been very involved with general education. Uh, I, I, I believe it to be a very important feature of American, the American higher education, the US higher education system. And I think that uh, it does a, a great deal of good to have uh, students at four-year universities, pretty much all of them, taking humanities classes where they are looking at um, texts in open-ended ways, texts and other cultural phenomena in open-ended ways, and, and trying to write analytically and coherently about these things. I'll point to one a different one, and it only it shows up only a little bit in our final chapter in the U.S. context, and that's the post-war Cold War context uh, in the the mid to late '60s, where on the one hand you have uh, University of California President Clark Kerr, famously of the Multiversity, um, is on the committee, uh, the ACLS, the Phi Beta Kappa Society, that that draft report that a few years later gets wrapped into and becomes the congressional legislation. Uh, that founds the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, and, that, and in that report, what is the purpose of the humanities? The purpose of the humanities is to uh, provide leisure for the future 10 hour work week, right? So here you have this uh, still lit on, ongoing uh, kind of Keynesian pursuit of a 10 hour work week in the society of, of abundance on the one hand, but it's very clear and Kerr, the report makes clear, and Kerr as contemporaneous letters and speeches also makes clear that this is leisure not in some kind of Aristotelian uh, uh, developmental sense, it's leisure as distraction. And he uses it explicitly to keep the campuses um, safe from uh, too much political uh, protest, right? So on the one hand, you have the humanities reduced to a leisure as a form of hobby or distraction. And at the same time, right, as, as what we all know, the new left. Uh, again, you, you know, you could just talk about Mario Sabio in at the free speech movement in, in Berkeley, invoking the humanities as that check or constraint against 
the machine or the factory, which is what they called, you know, you see, uh, what, do you, what do you term you see, you see Berkeley as, and you see the same thing in a 1968 uh, conference at Yale uh, about the possibility of establishing a black studies program where you have in the same lineup of folks uh, invoking the humanities as a check on a number of things. And I find that both compelling, right? But also, and, and that's why I think the contemporaneous invocation by Kerr of the humanities as a form of, of leisure, how quickly that is folded back into what we describe as kind of the functionalization of these desires within the institutional history of the university. Because when we really, when we talk about the modern humanities, at least for me, the way I see it, it's really an institutional history and you know, kind of putting uh, the intellectual history uh, as, a, as a way to describe how these institutional norms and ultimately functionalization of them get wrapped up. So I think that uh, on the jujitsu of humanities as leisure, humanities as new left romantic desire for liberation. Um, and, or the humanities as subversive, the humanities as conservative and ideological. And, and it, you know, it's both of those things. I think that's uh, that's persuasive. Well, I this was a question I was originally going to ask later in our discussion, but since you're bringing up the ways that the book uses the German history of higher education to think often about the U.S. context in which we find ourselves. I mean, in this audience, you don't have to explain why Germany would be such an important reference point. I think we all understand that. Um, I wanted to ask about one of the differences between the German context and the U.S. context that might make the application importation context of the German thinkers you look at and the German institutional history you look at a bit difficult to apply to the US even if we did model the research universities of the United States on those in Germany. And that's related to something you just brought up. So many of the thinkers you talk about are very, very comfortable with selectiveness being one of the functions of the university not really troubled by any elitism that would result. If anything, as you kind of both gesture to, their concern is that there's not enough constraint and there's not enough elitism and there's not enough selectivity. And that's certainly a strain in any educational institution, you know, where there's tests and exams and all kinds of ways of ranking and grades and ways of ranking people. But certainly in the United States, as we have known since de Tocqueville, democracy is interpreted as equality much more than it's interpreted as freedom. And that means there's always a discomfort in the United States with anything that is about elitism, even as we also claim to be a meritocracy. So I'm just curious if there are examples you can think of where you can really see the tension between the selectivity and elitism built into the idea of the university, particularly as construed by German thinkers and pedagogues when it's brought into the US context with its emphasis on a more populist egalitarian idea of democracy. I'll start off with one, one moment and you could consider it kind of a, a founding moment of translation. And that's with the 19, 1862 Morrill Act, right? Which um, was the first big federal infusion of cash into the US higher education system and really had a, a transformative and continues, of course, to have a transformative effect. And one of, one of the things it did, of course, was to help advance and fund by investing in technical education with you know, the ag schools, um, but also uh, with, with Cornell, but also with Harvard, with, also with Yale, all, with, with private universities to help them establish scientific institutions, as they called them. But also, as almost as a, as a dangling addition, was liberal education. And I really see that right, kind of as, as a stand-in already in 1862 as, as a stand-in to, okay, what do we do with liberal education? What do we do? And then this will become, and I think, I think actually the modern humanities are more than anywhere else kind of institutionalized in the United States and especially in the 18, 1930s and, and 1940s. But from that very beginning, right, this, this kind of unprecedented as you, as you suggested, Sharon, this unprecedented idea that the university ought to be 
whether that in reality turns out to be the case or how that turns out to be the case is a, obviously related to a different question. An instrument of democracy makes the history of quote, the modern humanities, I, th I think actually much more fascinating in, in, in the US context because you have folks like Kerr who of course is, is run out by, by Reagan uh, in, 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 in the 60s and there's no reason simply to dismiss his stated commitments to something like a humanistic uh, ideal of education, but you have to, to ask how and why. So that the, the moral act is one moment that, and this isn't answering your question, but it's putting kind of a flag, like from the beginning, institutionally, that tension was there and it was there supposedly in the name of, of, of democracy as, as, it, as it were, but that is a huge difference uh, over and against the German context. Um, just to uh, add a little bit to that, uh, well, there were, of course, um, moments of direct antagonism starting very early. Uh, the, the first Americans to get uh, PhDs in Germany uh, did so at the beginning of the 19th century. One of them was George Bancroft, um, uh, for whom the Bancroft uh, History Prize is, is named. And when he came back to the US, uh, to Harvard in like 1811 or something to, uh, to <clears throat> and tried to institute some German style curricular reforms um, that, that were regarded at Harvard as elitist and unduly rigorous. He was physically attacked by students and uh, um, pretty much run out of the place. Um, and then in the late 19th century, when uh, the big transformation of American higher education was ongoing. There was tremendous resistance to what was perceived to be the, the German model, part of it on the grounds that it was elitist, um, that it, it was this model of rigor that um, alienated some students who were there for a, another kind of education, um, something a little you know, broader, more accessible. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, there was a great deal of, of debate about that. And to some extent, these things remain unresolved. I but I would, I would add as, as also, the, Paul, you're, you're putting your finger on something and the, the various uses to which that is put, because what, one of the biggest advocates of supposedly kind of the democratic promise of a humanities education were the new humanists, right, of the early part of the 20th century. People, and and th th this claim that the Prussianization of literature, the Prussianization of philosophy, is, which is how they kind of referred to this research model, um, undercut the democratic promise of, uh, of the history of literature, of the, of the history of philosophy. But the ends towards which they wanted to put that was, was a, a, a vision of democracy that was, uh, you know, less than robust and even uh, you know, maintaining exclusions that were already up and running, even if different than the Prussian ones. Right, the American system is in its way incredibly elitist. Um, and even though uh, there's a much higher percentage of, of people going to college in the US now than in Germany, um, in, in some ways, <coughs> um, Germans are, are right to see our system as more elitist um, than theirs with these iconic universities being nearly impossible to get into and the you know, students at these top universities uh, generally coming from homes that are you know, quite wealthy. Um, uh, so you know, it, it, it gets quite convoluted at a certain point. There are also some very interesting colorful convolutions having to do with cultural misunderstandings um, when some of the emigres uh, who arrived uh, in, in the US in the 30s, the emigres from, from Nazi Germany, um, were, um, were invited to, uh, uh, to present um, models of scholarship that were thought of as being a certain way because there were certain um, fairly fixed notions about what German scholars did when uh, in, in some prominent cases, these scholars were critics of the the German system of, of specialization and disciplinary norms. Um, one of the uh, more notable cases is that of Erich von Kahler, who was a member of the uh, Georga circle and a critic of Max Weber and Max Weber's notion of Wissenschaft. And he was arguing basically against uh, this ideal of Wissenschaft that had become so influential in, in German um, society and wanted to re-enchant science basically. And he was brought in to Ohio State, um, my university, um, to be a champion of, of method and a modernizer 
um, of, <coughs> of literary studies when in fact uh, he was looking to do something quite different. So I wanna zoom way out now and uh, talk about the really deep history into which we can place some of the questions that you raise. You're um, very careful to point out that the history of the humanities is not coterminous with the history of humanism and that really the humanities begin with modernity and with the university. But you also talk a fair amount about the origins of the university, at least in medieval Europe, as religious institutions. And one thing I'd just like to ask you to talk more about is where that genealogy in religion has migrated in the humanities. You know, what happened to that religious impulse? And how do you see that affecting these debates about the humanities as being both a cause and effect of and a cure of crisis. Paul, do you want to start or do you want me to? Yeah, I was thinking that you would. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, no, I think this is definitely kind of a red thread, but one that I didn't want to pull on at least too, too strongly, lest it overwhelm, uh, overwhelm the book. Because one of the key movements we, we track is, in a, in a way, the inversion of what, you, what historically have been called kind of the, the lower and upper faculties, right? The arts faculties and the professional faculties, theology, law, um, and, and medicine. And the, low, the arts faculties, the, the ones that housed rhetoric, the ones that housed moral philosophy, were always preparatory faculties, right? They, they prepared people to go up to the, the professional faculties and they were never considered uh, things you would study, a path you would go, um, in and of itself, right? They, they, they uh, prepared you to go for a professional education. And one of the kind of the Prussian inversions, right? Iconically kind of summarized in, in Kant's 1798 conflict of faculties arguments is that it's actually the lower faculties uh, that are the higher faculties with philosophy, right? And so it gets read up the philosophy faculty. And, and, and that was the point you can institutionally, the PhD becomes possible uh, not just possible, but it, you know, kind of first <laughs> is, is, is on offer. And I, you know, I see that as kind of an institutional um, inversion of the, the theological question or the religious question, right? These forms of study that can't sustain themselves on their, on their own, right? They need a higher orientation, be that professional or above all, be that theological, uh, theological. And it's, it's that tension that, you, that runs through Germany. Germany captures it by putting, uh, maintaining theology departments in the arts and humanities faculties, right? And the US response to it, I think is actually, and this is already in, in the second half of the 19th century, is, is, much more, is much stronger. It's much more, for lack of a better term, uh, secularly strident in, in, in the sense that uh, no theology departments typically already uh, in the last third of the 19th century are not slotted into arts and sciences faculty. They aren't slotted alongside history and philosophy. They're carved off uh, as divinity schools, uh, schools of, of, of divinity. And that was a very, that was a marked difference, right? Another one of these you know, differences that we could put in the catalog of why the story is, uh, is similar. It, they're, 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 they're continuities, but a lot of disruptions. And so you, that's one institutional kind of way of thinking about it. But then I would say the overpromising thread that we, we trace, um, I see that, right? The compensatory thread, um, if you have smooth secularization theses, which we try to push against, um, it, it, the humanities are understood and marshaled variously as explicit, implicit, um, as implicitly or explicitly compensating for this event that takes place, right, when theology is booted or demoted in the university. And, and that's a thread that, that contains all kinds of conflicts and is related to the overpromising that we, we try to trace. So that if modernity attacks people's sense of faith or solidity or just a provision of a structure in which to find meaning, the humanities become a place where you could turn to that instead in a secular mode, but it's a secular solution to spiritual or religious problems. 
Yeah, yeah, and 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 I think because part of the settlement, and like here's where you know want an opinion. Here's you know here's an opinion. I think one of the biggest tragedies of this. I mean, maybe you did want an opinion, but I'll I'll offer. I, 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 one of one of one of one of kind of the the entailments that I have a a, a normative kind of allergy to is whatever you think about the humanities or literature or philosophies, the way they're institutionally capable of doing those types of things that we just talked about, the institutional effect it did have, and I think this has been disastrous, is that it excused everybody else, the natural scientists, engineers, uh, chemists, biologists, from having to give a damn about any of these questions, right, on institutional and conceptual and also historical grounds. And so you, what you have is like the humanities divisions. You don't have the first humanities divisions until like the mid to late 30s and then in, in, in through the 50s, everybody's establishing these. Um, it, it's not just that those questions are put in those courses, is that they are cordoned off. And everybody else, e even the, the, the administrators, so understood, are excused from having to at least consider questions of meaning, questions of value, uh, questions, uh, nor normative questions, and it's the, uh, you know, I think of it as this post facto ethics, you know, the scientists, the social scientists produce the actual progressing knowledge, and, and, and the humanities will uh, counsel the rest of us on how to, to deal with that. And so I think yeah. that's one of the biggest tragedies and consequences of uh... <laughs> All right. My kid, yeah, 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 you can't interrupt me, sorry. My... She's very concerned about the humanities. Um, wait, now I can't, okay. Are you, somebody say something. I wanna make sure I can still hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, all right. I, as any of you who've ever had a cat know, there is no point in my trying to do anything about her. Hopefully she'll just walk away soon. Um, so, well, actually just to follow up on that, I would say that it's also, it's quite common then for either people in the sciences to feel comfortable expressing complete contempt for what the humanists do because it's not real knowledge, or I think even worse, to ask that we fulfill this kind of pastoral spiritual function and get quite uh, irate when there's any suggestion that we too are a field of knowledge that might have specific methods, jargon of our own, after all, it's academia, but there's a sense that we're supposed to be some kind of universal language. Mm -hmm. So, and, and of course, there's no coherence around any of this. You can find all of these attitudes on display like in the same meeting. No, no, absolutely, right? I mean, so, so you have this uh, compensatory uh, function that is attributed to us um, not even to speak of kind of the, the philosophical, just like woefulness of that kind of, you know, moral thinking, right? That, that oh, morals is about consoling and, you know, you know that, that, that kind of individualistic, profoundly liberal uh, uh, functionalization. But you have, as, as you so rightly note, you have um, the erasure of an entire uh, centuries old or new forms and practices of knowledge, right? So, if, if you know the the first the first discipline at least in the Prussian context that was kind of self consciously a discipline that had the first like big humanities grants and stuff was philology. I mean it was it it, it was a it was a research practice. It was a knowledge producing practice, and that is also I think in this cordoning off of social functions that in, especially in the U.S. context that's another um, kind of it's not as tragic, it's pernicious effect uh, of this, you know, cutting off entire, uh, at least institutionally, right, and hyperbolic, entire um, fields and, and domains and disciplines of, of knowledge by not considering them uh, in the game of knowledge, as it were. So if I can follow up with another question about Paul, I want to check, did you want, was there anything you wanted to add to no. this? I was just nodding uh, in agreement with Chad's answer. So one of the chapters I found the most interesting was the one about the sciences. And I have, so 
I have an invitation to you just to talk more about it and also a question. So you show how there was actually a moment where there was a real debate in the sciences between what we might call, or I think you do call it kind of humanistic science that says science can address questions of the spirit, science should not be hyper specialized and focused only on the physical universe, but look at connections. And in that, and that's a humanistic science because it doesn't see the humanities as far into it and because it wants to make the kinds of uh, connections and even cures to modernity that usually have been applied only to the humanities. And they're in heated debates with a view of the sciences that is specialized, more materialistic, more applied. And in fact, this debate does still linger on in the university because you know, for me, where I often sit in the humanities, it seems like all the scientists are allied, but actually they have a lot of tension between pure science and applied science with the feeling that it's very hard to get funding for pure science. Now, it's not necessarily that today the pure scientists see themselves like Haeckel, one of the people you look at as engaged in asking spiritual questions, although there are scientists who also talk about the beauty of the universe. It's certainly, you can see Darwin for all his being responsible for a lot of modern secular crises. He's kind of gesturing towards some of this himself. So. I'd just like you to talk a bit more about that because I found it so interesting. It really shook up what is otherwise, you know, a, a reasonable narrative about humanities versus the sciences. And it also raised the question for me of where the social sciences are. Because in your book, you know, you certainly talk a lot about Weber, but I would say, and I mean, he's one of the heroes of your book, but the social sciences are not an active player in your book. And uh, they're in an interesting position because, of course, they're kind of sort of humanistic and they're kind of sort of scientific, which might be why you didn't bother to focus on them. They wouldn't have taught us anything we couldn't learn by looking at the humanities and the sciences. But anyway, the, the comment part of this is tell us more about that chapter. And then the question part is what does that say about where the social sciences are in your narrative? Paul, I can take the, the, the science question if you want to take the, the social, social yeah. science. Sure. Um, just very briefly, I think that um, I think that's the most important chapter of the book, <laughs> in a way, and uh, at least for me, because one thing that we're trying to do there is that make turning science into a monolith, like capital S science, <laughs> was a was a huge project, and I think the narrative that we're trying to tell there that it was a huge project. And the way that people like Helmholtz and uh, and Vichel, the way that they quote did that in, in Germany was uh, through a, a, a propaganda or popular campaign in which they argued in a way that it was physiology, not philology, that was the true liberal educating force, right? If we really want liberal citizens, and that was the shared premise among kind of the elite uh, you know, Bismarckian uh, kind of well, pre and, and, and uh, during Bismarck's um, tenure is the goal is to produce liberal citizens for a liberal nation. And the way to do that, liberally minded, concerned about historical progress, concerned about uh, social conditions, uh, the way you have to do that is to educate them according with, in, in accord with the natural sciences, because that not only induces people into rigorous, precise thinking, uh, but it, it also makes them more liberally minded and magnanimously connected and working for the sake of their you know, fe fellow. Uh, whereas philology just makes you a stick in the mud pedant. And I, to me, and that took a lot of work. You know, these, these were popularizing uh, scientists, but I mean, Helmholtz is also, I mean, he was a cutting edge uh, natural sciences as well. So in a way, uh, we try to show there that they're creating the natural sciences as this monolith that can, you know, carry forward what uh, philology and philosophy, especially after the death of Hegel, um, was seen not to be able to do anymore. And that was as much a victory um, considered, you know, by the natural scientists as anything else. 
And so, and at the end, okay, well, what do you do with philo uh, philology and philosophy? Will you slot them into this private affair, right? It's a matter of the soul, right? And the great quotes about what, what Goethe is good for. And you have this chemist who's the rector of the faculty um, of the University of Berlin in, 18, uh, in the 1890s where you know, he is homage to what the sciences have become, the natural sciences has become, but he concludes with, but doesn't every bureaucrat, just like every uh, chemist, need to remember their Homer, right? He quotes Homer, but they need to remember their Homer for their own private, right? their own private lives, not mm -hmm. as a matter of public common effort. Back to the leisure model. Yeah. One of the things that we try to do in the book uh, is give an account of the unity ideal in German academic culture that goes beyond um, the, uh, I don't know if there's a standard one, but they're ones that you in encounter if you read around in the scholarship on this area. And the, uh, the idea there is that this was kind of a romantic trope or something that came out of uh, German idealist philosophy and people were uncritically, um, they subscribed to it uncritically and it was kind of a credo of sorts and it didn't really have much in the way of, of intellectual content. Um, and we, uh, in, our, in the uh, first chapter of the book, um, we try to show how this ideal is um, a, a, a reflection of concerns about what the processes again that um, make it possible for the for liberal higher education to flourish this the the threat that they pose the uh, university uh, architects or the architects of the modern research university like uh, people like Wilhelm von Humboldt and uh, Fichte and Schleiermacher they were pretty uh, aware of some of the uh, the dangers that they were introducing by going to a model where um, you would be rewarded through academic achievement. Um, they understood that this would uh, result in increasing specialization and they wanted to um, have something in place that would pull in the other direction. And they thought um, long and hard about the kinds of hermeneutical processes that, that might provide something in the way of, of unity. And um, <clears throat> by the 1830s, it became pretty clear that the humanities were, were um, we're becoming fragmented through specialization. There's a great deal of hand wringing about this. And the <clears throat> natural sciences, um, figures in the natural sciences like Fierschau and Helmholtz, they really jump in and present themselves as the, um, uh, the people who can create meaningful intellectual unity through what they do. And um, we, uh, we found uh, tracking this struggle over who's going to be the custodian of unity. I think uh, Chad will agree that we both found this very, uh, very interesting kind of gripping sort of, there's, uh, there's, there's money at stake, they're competing for institutional resources and the German government, you know, then as it always has, uh, has uh, been thrifty with universities. It's never just opened the coffers and said, you know what, you're doing great work. Um, you're a jewel, um, and we're going to support you lavishly. There's always um, uh, a great deal of competition for, for funding, and uh, Helmholtz and Fierchow, they did very well in this, and it was, uh, it was dispiriting to some humanists to see how well they were doing in the, uh, uh, the area of attracting um, limited government resources, and there were also, um, we think, some very interesting attempts at countering this on the part of humanists. I mean, there weren't just attempts at countering this. Um, they were serious intellectual undertakings in their own right, but they can be read as, 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 as that as well. Attempts to scale humanities research um, up to the point where it looked like it was competing with the natural sciences in terms of you know, the, the, uh, the amount of data collection, for example. Oh, there, to, and, and to add and briefly, directly to your question, Sharon. I mean, it's also, I think, helpful to remember that the US, US institutions beat German institutions to institutionalizing social sciences. Even, even if we think of, you know, Weber, all this, you know, the Columbia, uh, you know, had, had the a sociology department, I think two, at least two decades before, um, or at least a decade before there were any German chairs 
in sociology, right? Weber at all, they were working either in politics or in, in, in uh, economics or legal fields. And that's not just, you know, a, a question of, of a name, it's a question of a perceived function, right? Because of course the Prussians who we, whom we track, they imagine the humanities to include social concerns, right? Because you had politics, you had economics, you had all of those wrapped, right. wrapped into these fields. And why, how, and to what end the social sciences kind of took institutional shape in the US in ways that was much more delayed in German context mm -hmm. is, a, is, a, is, is, is fascinating. And I think leads to questions of like, what are the dominant paradigms say in the, for example, in the Cold War, well, industrial relations and economics, I mean, with her, that, that was, that was his, his field and um, as kind of master control uh, disciplines. I'll stop there. So uh, I think I have time to ask you two more questions. So I'm going to have my penultimate question, which is one of the things that was most uh, entertaining and also very interesting in the book was how you show over and over and over again that uh, complaints about the university and the humanities that might seem to us relatively recent have really been going on almost as long as there have been universities. So um, like people saying, oh, these disciplines or this scholarship is too specialized. Then other people saying, no, but it needs to be specialized. Don't be too generalist. People saying, oh, this kind of scholarship, especially in the humanities, is too positivist, it's too objective, trying to deal with facts. Other people saying it's too subjective, it's too much about values. As I gestured towards earlier, there are people who complain that the university is too elitist. There are people who complain it's not elitist enough. That's been going on for 200 years, you show. But even other things that really we would have thought, I would have thought were much more recent and historically specific, over-reliance on adjuncts, complaints about grade inflation and grade grubbing and academic careerism, the dangers of new media, the fact that all students want to do is drink and party and carouse and make a lot of money after they graduate. Like you find people saying these things, it, it, really you could take the quotes and ask someone to date them and most people would have said, no, that's very recent, but the, we're going back to 1840. So my question about this is, I, I completely accept that there are all these continuities, but the book really does emphasize continuities. And I'd like to ask you here to just draw out for us what are some of the discontinuities? What are some of the moments in your history that seem very specific to a time and place? What are some things, and I think maybe more pressing is this part of the question, what are some things happening right now that of course, are connected to the past, everything always is, but really seem genuinely new and um, therefore might not be addressed by looking at this longer history. Well, I think that some of the continuity is misleading and maybe we're, you know, we're, we're, we're guilty of not underlining that as, as much as we should. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, the arguments sound quite similar, but they're talking about totally different institutions. Um, you know, in the case of Germany in the 1840s, you're talking about tiny institutions, um, which are, uh, you know, all male and pretty much all white. And um, you can, a, a debate about access and scalability in that context is of course very different um, from a debate about access and scalability in the context of a system that is, you know, ed educating tens of millions of, of students. Um, so <clears throat> uh, I think that, uh, you know, that is, um, is worth mentioning. But you guys actually do make a point quite late in the book of saying that, uh, that uh, feminism, for example, has not been as radical a break as it might seem with this tradition of seeing the humanities as a way of addressing the, the crises of modernity. So I feel like the book does make a claim for continuities. And I'm not saying that it's an incorrect claim. I just thought it would, this would be an occasion for you to um, 
I, I mean, I take what you're saying just now, Paul, to be a comment on the past, but what difference do you think it makes to these debates that, for example, now the universities are so open to so many different kinds of people, although there's still a lot of limits to that, and are educating so many more people? How has that difference what difference has that made to how people talk about the humanity? Yeah, the, the way, the way I, I think that's great and the way I would respond to it hasn't made enough of a difference. And I think the, the reason it hasn't made enough of the difference is, is the unfortunate continuity of our institutional norms and structures uh, that, and here's what I mean by this. So even though the broader context, the social context the social conditions in which the, our universities sit have radically changed, the internal organization and institutional norms have not changed as much. So one thing that is a, a categorical difference is the, the financialization of higher education, by which I mean, you know, not simply, you know, uh, students are concerned about jobs. I mean, no, the actual financialization where you have like a UVA, and I think even the Wall Street Journal did a bigger report on this a couple of weeks ago, these endowment returns, uh, which were, 40%, over 50% of the UVA was like 46%. And a huge chunk of those were, of course, in uh, hedge funds. This is not only that, but you know, using, uh, leveraging student dorms, right? And the, the important, there are all kinds of questions about that, but I think it puts it into a context which you can't compare today's adjunctification blithely just you know, because of a certain internal reliance on it. So that, those are the conditions that can't be made to be understood, or uh, the university as the key meritocratic engine and engine of economic progress. That is very different from the relationship of say, Prussian universities and, and the chemical industry uh, at the end of the 19th century. And, and yet, and this is why I think the continuity argument, at least for me, is important, despite these radical, like to me, like fundamental shifts in political economy, institutionally speaking, yes, big differences, I know, but institutionally speaking, in terms of the norms, in terms of the organization of knowledge, the shifts have at least not been a, 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 as radical. And I think that, like to me, the fact that we have been so continuous, even though yes, we're different, relative to completely changed and like, we don't even know what to do with them now, uh, political e economy questions, to me, that's the bigger, mm. uh, that's what really, uh, worries me and, and and we don't as an institution as a community as as a historical project we we, we don't know what to do with that and so we've been captured and, and and functionalized by conditions that we uh kind of yeah so i, I don't know if that makes sense so i yeah, absolutely. absolutely absolutely argument to me is crucial because it shows up the red flashing difference right. of the political economic conditions in which we find ourselves. Right. I just that, um, and it's, it's, it, it's hard to formulate a response to these conditions using the traditional uh, terms of discussion, using traditional justifications for what the humanities can do and, and have done. And we take a, a, a look at some of these attempts and mm -hmm. we're not claiming to have one um, of our own, but just um, to uh, to to see how they tend to kind of fizzle when they get to the crucial point of saying, okay, here's really what the humanities can do in this situation. Right, and we need to turn now to the questions from the audience, but I wanna say that one of the aspects of the book that I really enjoyed was that you are, instead of trying to defend the humanities or say what the humanities can do, have a very cautionary note to sound about not over-promising, not only about what the humanities can do, but even about what universities can do. That said, I do think we all need to be able to come up with answers to the question do we need universities? What are universities good for that we can live with? Which you do at the end, again, through, um, through turning to Max Weber's scholarship as a vocation. But I also know that some of the questions being posed get at these really big questions, such as what are universities good for, which you, know, you wrote this book, so now people are going to ask you. So I'm going to let you look at the questions and select which ones you wanna start with. And we've been reminded that you should read the question aloud before you start answering it.
Um, I'll just address one question by, uh, in a sense, just reading it, because I think it's important. And I'm, it's one way that I'm trying to understand just what Shannon was talking about. Like, what kinds of cases do we make? In a sense, like, what are we fighting for <laughs> exactly? And um, the question is, okay, I mentioned, Chad mentioned his work on general education at UVA, but also more positively, um, adult education humanities programs. Can you recommend any such programs to the audience, concrete programs? Um, sure, you know, UVA Edge is one, but I would just say, uh, this is where I really found the inadequacy when I first taught and helped start this adult um, liberal arts program at UVA just last spring and taught in it the spring of the summer. Um, and the first class is moving through now. Um, this is where I found the inadequacy of our institutional structures, like talking about the humanities, the natural sciences, and, and using the terms that I at least, and I think historically, many of us have been inculcated into completely inadequate. Um, and because, and this suggests the, the, the unprecedented historically, I would argue, power that the BA has to confer or deny basic human worth questions, right? Uh, not, not just questions of who's making more money, absolutely, we know that, uh, but more fundamental questions. And that's the political economy in which the university, I think, finds itself um, now. And so this question about kind of adult education, um, I was, I, I found myself to be the, the real student uh, there to understand, wait a minute, I, I don't, I can't give you a response to this question because I'm so enmeshed. Right, in this in this institution, and the what I thought could be you know historical observations and conceptual recommendations, um, just seemed really paltry in in light of that. So I know I didn't answer the question explicitly, but I think it's in, for me it's important to to lift that up. Um, there are a, a lot of great programs uh, outside of of universities, or that are outside of universities and work with universities that. Uh, uh, support um, humanistic activity or the, the activity of the, the, the humanities. And, and one of the things that's, I think that, that rubs both Chad and me a, a little bit the wrong way about some of the claims that uh, academic humanists make for the academic humanities is the suggestion that somehow this has to happen within the context of the university, that um, this process of cultural mediation that humanistic study is supposed to deliver uh, has to happen there. Um, and in fact, of course, that's not the case. Sharon, you asked about change. Um, I think that uh, this is an, an exciting area of change. I think that uh, humanists today are looking outside the university more than they did 20 years ago. I think it's much more common for uh, graduate students in the humanities to come up writing for non-academic publications and being involved heavily in that world. And I think that there's less pressure on them not to do that and to focus on uh, their process of professionalization. I don't think that the old standards of professionalization and specialization are gone, but I do think that there's a greater flexibility now. In greater flexibility? I mean, come on though, Paul, that's like saying, uh, the market making you uh, write on a gig economy is more flexible. No, it's not. It's it's a collapsed humanities market, and people have to do that if they want to earn a living. Sorry, it's my guy. Like the pretense of the the careful scholar. Right? I mean, wouldn't you say like we can't celebrate we're more flexible? No, it's our students. You know, ha haven't gotten jobs, and so they had to figure out a life for themselves. Or so I. I mean, is that fair? I think we're actually right? talking about two different things, though. I think yeah. Paul's talking about people who have a place in the university. The uh, very I, few, I, the increasingly small number of us who manage to have tenure track and tenured positions looking out to something broader. And I think, Chad, you're talking about people uh, trying to use yeah. their degrees in the humanities in ways that are not how they intended to use them because we have a very contracting labor market. I, mean, I would say that the two things are related. I'm certainly not trying to make the case that you know there's an upside to the devastation of the humanities job market, which is that it's freeing in a way because if you don't think that you're gonna get a job as an academic uh, humanist, then you know why not do other things as you're in your PhD program? Um, 
but I, I, I think that um, for uh, various reasons, um, it has become somewhat more culturally acceptable with, within the humanities to do non-academic writing as you're pursuing a degree um, with perhaps still the hope of, of getting an academic job. Um, and then, yeah, of course, um, there are uh, other reasons why, um, you know, there's, there's people uh, doing freelance work out of immediate material need and, and um, some of the people who are obviously, so obviously graduate student stipends are not lavish things and people may be doing that sort of work to, you know, to supplement their income. But, um, <clears throat> and I'm drawing on limited experience here, but I do know that um, when I started doing this kind of non-academic writing as a graduate student in the humanities, um, I felt some, uh, some blowback from my professors who, uh, suggested that you know if I wanted to be a journalist then I should be a journalist and if I wanted to be an academic then I should be an academic and it wasn't really uh, such an established thing to do it was, it was I hope this doesn't sound self-congratulatory it just wasn't that it wasn't that usual um, and I think that uh, it's much more common today there are much more uh, uh, there are many more venues as a result of you know the internet and um, online publications that have uh, low overhead because some of these things can be done less expensively on the internet. So um, I am, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so can I actually try to connect this to two questions that have come up? So one is about the internet. There is a question about not confining the humanities to the university. And I, I think this has come up a bit already, but you know, if we're thinking about Act, well, I'm going to try to combine three questions. If we're thinking about the humanities as a way of providing people access to certain texts or ways of thinking that train people for democracy, which is one standard justification for education and education in the humanities in the United States, and this was Ulrich Baer's question, what happens can that happen outside the university? So, so Uli's question is, can we think of the university outside of training citizens for democracy? Another question is, can we think of training for democracy happening outside the university? Can we think of education in the humanities happening via Khan Academy and master classes and Wikipedia and you know, the, a, a host? I, we don't have to limit ourselves to those examples, which are not necessarily the best ones. And there's a question that I think we should throw into the mix, which is a bit of the elephant in the room, which is what would you say about the declining enrollments in the humanities? Is there anything that could reverse that? And how I pull these together is also to ask whether perhaps interest in the humanities is declining within the university, but does that mean interest in the humanities is declining? If we take a broader look at all the different ways people can engage with art, music, literature, philosophy. Yeah, I'll pick up and I'll pick up on that last strand of yours, uh, Shannon, and say that was the, in a sense, that was my personal finding or <laughs> not revelation, but it, it became glaringly obvious to me kind of at the end of this, is that um, discussions, debates, reading, uh, art, literature, novels, philosophy are, are everywhere, um, but in forms that aren't necessarily legible to the humanities and the, because for us you know you, you buy it or you don't uh the argument of permanent crisis is that the modern humanities are historically and conceptually an institutional project of a particular system right the modern uh research university and so it, it to say that you know aren't we excluding the humanities what some people call the public humanities you know, no because that the, it, at least on our argument you don't have to accept the terms but for us Though, no, that, that's people reading art, that's, or people reading novels, that's people reading literature, people, uh, you know, designing TikToks and sharing them, whatever that might be. And that is, 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 is alive, robust, and bursting at the seams, I, I, at least is, is my experience. And, um, and, but I think that's different from the institutional project of the humanities, which have, which is, I, you know, is caught in the system of, 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 of maintaining not just the humanities, but the authority and legitimacy of a whole set of interests, even as the boundaries, the political calm beyond the university has, has changed dramatically. And I think one of those would be, you know, can we think of universities apart 
from forming educating from, from what was it from training democratic citizens or it was Uli's question um I don't know I not, and I'm not being sarcastic like well I it, it, it can we think of universities that actually do that right I know they say they say they do uh but I, I think that's a that's been a norm and that's been an assertion for a hundred years now and but but access to particular institutions I would argue isn't necessarily democratic formation uh that 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 is so often conflated with it um, well, first of all, hi, Oli. Um, thanks for the question. Um, and I think that there are uh, some real difficulties with the, you know, the, the democratizing or the dem forming democratic citizens argument, even though, you know, it is something that I um, personally derive meaning from in my activities as a, 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 a humanities professor. Um, one is that uh, not everybody goes to college. Right. So, I mean, what are we implying when we when we sit when we say this that people who have gone to college are somehow better citizens than others? Um, if you look at uh, how people have voted with college degrees, without college degrees, uh, historically, it's been you know it's not the, the, the correlations are are not so easy to uh, to pin down. Although recently there have been some uh, some developments there that are maybe a, you know a little troubling to some. Um, I also uh, think that it's absolutely the case that people have discussions outside of the humanities where, or universities where they develop uh, their skills at critical reasoning and formulating rational arguments. Um, there are lots of spaces um, where, 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 where people do this. Um, and I certainly don't think that the university has a, a monopoly on them. On the other hand, I do again think that the university is a good place for developing some um, skills of, of, of this kind, uh, ab absolutely. Um, but uh, um, as I said, there are some, some problems with, uh, with, with that argument. There's also the problem that once you, uh, and I mentioned, I alluded to this earlier, once you, you uh, hang your hat on that, once you say that this is what the humanities do, the university generally, but the humanities in particular, um, uh, they help students uh, develop democratic faculties, they have a democratizing function, then any aspect of the humanities that seem to pull against that is very, very threatening, and you don't want to talk about it. And you wind up then having a very foreshortened discussion of what Bildung is, even as you're trying to, you know, advance some notion of Bildung, and that's a, that's a problem. There's a question about how this intellectual and institutional history intersects with the history of labor, particularly in terms of thinking about the role of adjuncts in the university now and in the past. And the, um, the question points out that it's often adjunct labor that allows more senior scholars to get course releases that allow them to write books, including this book. So in that context, it seems especially urgent to just bring that in. And you did point to the ways that adjunct labor has actually been part of a long history of the university and that is interesting to know more about, but then also how has that changed and what is going on today that is different? And does this affect the humanities differently than the sciences, for example, now? Paul, do you want to I, don't yeah. know I mean, I can say certainly say some things about it. Um, I mean, I, I like to think that um, we pay uh, quite a bit of attention to this in, in the book um, about uh, not simply the fact of adjunctification, um, but uh, the role that it's played in shaping the production of knowledge. Uh, one of the things that a bad job market does is it encourages specialization. If you're under a lot of of, of pressure, then um, <clears throat> and you, you have to fit yourself through a very very narrow passage in order to get a job. Then you're you know, you're probably going to conform to the disciplinary standards as much as possible. And so it's 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 been a real driver of specialization uh, 
historically. And uh, there's also been a lot of, of uh, defeatism about it. Um, uh, Baber, uh, you, you mentioned, is a hero of the book. He is, but um, there are things in Baber that we criticize. And one of those things is that he has this, um, this, this very uh, quiescent attitude toward adjectification and his famous Wissenschaftler's Beruf, uh, Science as a Vocation lecture. He starts out by talking about the horrors of the academic job market and says uh, to his listeners who are students, you know, if you can't deal with the idea of somebody less talented than you, um, less hardworking, having a better institutional position, if you can't deal with the act that luck plays a greater, greater role here than it does elsewhere, then you should go into something, you should go into something else. Um, but he doesn't uh, say anything about how this could be remedied. He doesn't, he, and he was not shy about um, pushing um, uh, the authorities, uh, the government, state officials, the minister of culture in Germany to do things, to, to reform the institution, to make the institution better. He basically just accepts that. And, and I think that, um, there's been a lot of acceptance of it here as well. Um, I'm hoping that that's changing. It, it, I think that uh, the uh, Sanders plan, um, including the, uh, the provision that 75% of faculty at public universities should be tenure or tenure track. Um, I think that that's, uh, that, that that's brought attention to this labor situation in a somewhat new way. And I'm hearing, um, uh, about hiring initiatives, large-scale hiring initiatives about univer uh, from, uh, at universities that have a long for a long time said, well, we just we'd like to, but we just can't. You know, we don't have the funds. Even as, of course, you know, their budgets. I mean, you can see what sort of resources they have, and that they're just putting money elsewhere, and that you know, they haven't wanted to hire people on the tenure track because, from a managerialist perspective, that has significant disadvantages. And um, so, um, this is something that I, uh, I, I hope is changing, um, will change, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see. Chad, did you wanna add to this? No, no, I'll, um... but I will say that it's kind of interesting um, that both Chad and I, uh, after this project, um, started to work on, or even while we were working on this project, started to work on projects connected to uh, labor conditions, labor theory. I'm doing a new translation of volume one of Capital and uh, Chad, in, in, in uh, Chad's most recent research, uh, he's been uh, looking at uh, the humanities and theories of, of, of labor. Um, and so that's, you know, not, uh, not a, a coincidence. It's also not a coincidence that Weber gave his vocation lecture in a lecture series on Geist Gabbard, right? The is, is intellectual work uh, possible in the future? This, you know, organized by the broader group, even though Benjamin, Baja Benjamin wasn't there, it was organized by uh, his fellows in the same uh, national political group. So that what it was the question is, is intellectual work as vocation possible as opposed simply to an intellectual, I guess, job, as, as we might call it, um, which, yeah, I'll just leave that there. So I'm going to let you both take a minute to look at all the questions that are, have been posed and you decide which ones you'd like to answer in the eight minutes we have left. Um, well, there are a lot of very interesting questions here. Thank you. Um, uh, Chad, do you have one that you uh, would like to address? Or you want me to choose? Um, I can address briefly uh, the question about kind of the breakneck speed of science, and especially during the pandemic, and you know what can the quote humanities do? And I think this is. 
perhaps not surprising. I, I think, uh, you know, this is another instance in which kind of our functionalization of science and the humanities and the social sciences um, within a fixed system that's been pretty stable has really come to undermine kind of our democratic efforts or collective efforts to deal with a, with a pandemic. You know, so how can the humanities help the sciences is, well, the reason that question is, is, uh, is in part necessary is because we have an idea of science and scientific progress that is excused from shouldering kind of the, these questions of social meaning, uh, these much more explicitly political questions, that is, and how to marshal and motivate uh, collective action. And, you know, so the humanities can step in either to historicize something or the humanities can step in to, you know, do X. And so this is not an answer to that, but I think even the formulation of the question, and this is you know, not an accusation, but because I think it's how we're, in a, in a way, we have to institutionally for, formulate the question. What, the, what do the humanities have to say uh, about the pandemic? Um, is the very fact that we're uh, kind of exhorted or uh, put in these ruts to ask the question in that way kind of, to my mind, speaks to our impoverished capacities to address uh, current, um, the current challenges we face. Um, I, uh, I will um, respond to question eight. Today's controversies in universities often center on free speech, free expression, and the humanities are commonly the stage for such controversies and blame for intolerance of offensive viewpoints. Any, idea, any ideas how humanists can respond to the pervasive view outside of academia that universities and today's students are less tolerant today than in earlier times? Well, I mean, the real expert on this uh, subject is Uli, um, who has written a book of, about basically this. Um, I would, say, I will say that um, you know uh, Christopher Christopher Newfield, who's a, a, a very um, vigorous and learned advocate for the humanities and is the incoming president of the MLA, I believe, um, he talks a lot about the need um, to uh, to present a compelling practical a, a compelling um, narrative. Um, that people who are, you know, in charge of uh, deciding what the budget for a, um, the, the budget allocation for a public university should be—that is, you know, state legislators—something that they can uh, can can really appreciate, um, and that universities generally should be doing this um, because he's an advocate not only of the humanities but of um, of universities, public universities in general, but but in, in particular as an English professor of the. Uh, humanities, and um, you know, it uh, it does seem to to be the case that uh, people who are advocates of the humanities have not done the best job of uh, of constructing this kind of of narrative in the face of narratives that, as the question suggests, portray the humanities. Uh, negatively, which seemed to have broad, uh, gained broad purchase. This book, our book, is obviously not going to really do anything to change that. It's, you know, it's not a book that's aimed at a, at a, a, a general audience, really. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an important question. So why, you know, uh, why is it that <clears throat> so many more people think that um, academic uh, the academic humanities are intolerant of free speech. That's the problem, um, particularly uh, speech that uh, uh, that expresses conservative viewpoints, and there isn't nearly as much attention paid to all the ways in which uh, humanists are um, made to feel threatened for uh, speaking um, uh, openly. Um, about you know this or or, or that issue, um, and uh, I don't really have a, um, a a great answer, but I do think it's a very important question, and um, would uh, you know think that it, it uh, wanted to draw attention to it for that uh, 
for that reason. Um, so we, we have two minutes left and I actually wanted to offer to wrap up with reading a couple of quotes from the end of the book that I do think provide your answer for the question, what are universities good for and what can the humanities do? It's a very measured answer, but towards the end of your sixth chapter, you are writing about Weber and you say, as Freud did with modern civil civilization, Weber called for permanent tension, permanent struggle in a phrase, permanent crisis. The refusal to assume that a meta-knowledge or university-based discourse could provide a unifying, totalizing way of life. That was what it meant to live as an intellectual adult in the modern world. The youth could perhaps be excused for rebelling against the renunciation demanded of them, actual adults, that is, professors couldn't. And I take you to be saying there that permanent crisis is what gives rise to the humanities, but that doesn't mean that the humanities should rise to the bait and say we can solve the crisis. In fact, the best answer we can give is this is how you live without being able to have grand unifying value systems. And this is how we approach texts that teach us how to live. It's also how we can reconcile the tension between the humanities as bildung and the humanities as scholarship, because you, you, I think, also come to a place where you say, just being able to establish certain claims, you know, maybe not in a positive this way, but the humanities can be a place where we learn to negotiate between saying, oh my God, nothing is true. What am I going to do? I can't make any decisions. I don't know how to live, which are questions we want our students to be asking and having crises about in college and saying, well, there are certain questions that I at least am going to answer in this way. You say uh, in your conclusion that in a world permeated with values and moral claims, intellectual work is of paramount importance its purpose is to make possible meaningful forms of life and that what we should be teaching our students and you say here universities shouldn't shy away from values. Rather, they should induce students to reflect conscientiously on the values they presume to be their own. They should teach students to understand how their own moral claims and values will inevitably conflict with those of others and that acting in accord with their values will have specific social consequences. So I think you offer us some rules to live by that are limited and modest, but therefore feasible. And so for that, I thank you. And I, I very much recommend this book to everybody. It was really a very interesting read for anyone who's ever been near a university. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much for, for uh, being here. And, and embarrassingly, I just realized that that question about free speech um, was from Oliver, um, so I said that he would be the one to, to answer it, and I guess that 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 that, that makes sense. And uh, Oli, um, I mean, I do have some ideas; they're not um, very inspiring, but I'll share them with you um, when when we uh, have a chance. Um, but uh, mainly, Sharon, I want to thank you so much for for doing this. Um, uh, really in, enjoyed your questions, and and uh, appreciate that you took the time to do this. And Juliana and Sarah and Christian and Sasha again, thank you guys so much for the organization. I really appreciate your, your interest in our work and your support. And thank you to the participants for, or to the audience for, for being here. Um, we appreciate your interest in our, our work immensely. And you know, we're easy to find. Um, so if you have a question that you want to ask uh, uh, that you didn't get a chance to ask or that we didn't answer, you know, um, by all means, send an email. Thank you, and thank you, Sharon, for the for providing this disclosure to 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 questions that, uh, in the end, will keep us all uh, busy thinking about it. I know there were a lot of people from academia in the audience, and we, of course, are all part of this. And it's uh, it's been really uh, intriguing to to think about our own role, institutional and personal, in in these uh, larger Fragen complex, so to speak. Uh, lots of food for thought. And of course, uh, please get the book if you don't have it yet. Permanent Crisis is the title. And uh, I will continue to be haunted by the cover that, that Sharon just uh, showed us. Uh, very, very striking that uh, um, has stayed with me for, for months now. And um, again, thanks, Chad, to uh, thanks 
to Chad and Paul for, for writing this book and for engaging in this um, wide ranging and thoughtful and provocative uh, discussion today. Uh, we didn't get around to answering or addressing all the questions, but we will forward the remaining questions to the panelists and uh, provide them with, uh, with additional thoughts from the audience. So thank you for being here today. And uh, also, if you have time next Friday, we'll have an uh, event that I think is worth your while. It's Rethinking Borders, a Necessary Utopia. And we will have um, Landita Sharma, Helka Heinz, and Gabriella at Mixoglu engaging in, in a very timely conversation about borders. And then, of course, in mid-November, we have our annual festival, Neue Literatur. So all of you who are interested in this festival that brings together authors from the German language world and US authors um, under the also timely topic, uh, Turn and Face the Strange, please join us between November 11th and 14th. In the meantime, um, happy Halloween and uh, Dia de los Muertos uh, and have a good weekend. Thank you for being here today and see you all hopefully soon. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you, Sharon, so good to see you. Thank you, 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 you guys. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everybody.